good afternoon. My name is Randy Schooneman. I am vice chairman of the International Republican Institute, and I am pleased to uh, host this event today to discuss the China nightmare, the grand ambitions of a decaying state by Dan Blumenthal. I should note this event is streaming live on Facebook, um, and that uh, this is a um, an event that really is in keeping with IRI's tradition of highlighting uh, the dangers of authoritarian regimes around the world. It was not too long ago that very few people saw China as a threat. Maybe a few Hollywood liberals uh, worried about uh, uh, Tibet or infatuated with the Dalai Lama or a few unreconstructed cold warriors who were concerned about Taiwan, but that has all changed uh, in the last decade or so, and particularly in the last few years. And it has changed because of the actions of the Leninist regime that is running the People's Republic of China. Uh, aggressive actions to change the status quo in Taiwan and the South China Sea, a massive military buildup, unprecedented intellectual property theft, ruthless crackdown in Hong Kong, genocide uh, agreed upon to use that term genocide on a bipartisan basis through two administrations now against the Uyghurs, a surveillance state more intrusive uh, than the world has ever seen in a drive to remake the world safe for the autocracy as practiced by the communist China, China's Communist Party. That coupled with economic stagnation, loss of legitimacy, rising crushing debt burden and a demographic time bomb is the China nightmare that Dan Blumenthal writes about. Uh, and Dan is perfectly suited to have written this book he has worked in the Pentagon. He has served in the China Commission. He is a scholar and a thinker of great renown on all things China and East Asia. And he has been a mentor to many, including to me, about Asia and Asian security. Um, and he also led the Asia team uh, in the 2008 campaign for president by our former chairman, uh, John McCain. So as I said, he's ideally suited you know, the new um, Indo-Pacific czar for the uh, Biden administration, Kurt Campbell wrote a foreign affairs article not long ago, uh, and it was entitled, How We Got China Wrong. Um, he and many others may have gotten China wrong, Republican and Democrat in the establishment, but Dan Blumenthal did not. Uh, and that this book that we're here to discuss today demonstrates that amply. And to lead that discussion, uh, we have Dana White joining us from California, IRI's newest board member. Uh, and Dana really is perfectly suited to moderate this discussion. She speaks several Asian languages. She has worked for and is currently working for Asian multinational companies. She worked in the Pentagon for Dan Blumenthal, as a matter of fact, and she worked with me in the 2008 McCain campaign. Um, so we've got a great discussion here on a fascinating and timely book uh, led by uh, Dana White. And Dana, I'd like to turn it over to you to, uh, to start the discussion off. Well, thank you, Randy, and thanks to everyone for joining us. And most of all, thank you to Dan and IRI. Um, Dan, I don't know if you remember, would remember this, but actually right now is about 17 years ago, I walked through your door at the Pentagon. And so I'm so excited to, to be able to ask you about this fantastic book that you've written. So let's just launch into it. First and foremost, why'd you write the book? Well, thanks, Dana. Thanks, Randy, for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, 17 years ago, time, time does fly. Uh, we were definitely back then working on what we saw as a China problem, not many people were, were listening, but uh, but we were trying our best to get uh, people at the Pentagon and elsewhere focused on what we saw as a, an, an emerging threat. So why did I write the book? Well, you know, I had been, I, I had done a lot of different things. I had been at the Pentagon for a number of years uh, doing China and Taiwan policy. I had served on this uh, congressional commission, so got to see, um, how Congress interacts with China, what they're interested in with respect to China. 
I've, I've been at AEI, American Enterprise Institute, for a, a number of years doing shorter pieces, traveling through China, traveling through Asia. And uh, I, I wanted, I really just wanted to put it all together. It took me a very long time uh, to do so, many, many years and many distractions. Uh, I wanted to stand back and see what can I offer as someone who's been in policymaking, been around Capitol Hill, been around politics, but also knows China. And um, I had thought about this thesis that I thought wasn't, uh, uh, was, was in some ways uh, complicated, you know, that, that China, as Randy Schuneman had mentioned, was both um, powerful, but also uh, has very many vulnerabilities. And I thought, how is the best way to explain that? And so, um, you know, there, there was no better way after a while than, than putting it all together in the book. So I'm curious, so, you know, a lot of people have talked about China's foreign policy in terms of securing its future. It's really about, you know, they have an immense population. They have an immense need for resources. Why is their foreign policy any different from that of any rising power? Well, in many ways, it, it is not. In many ways, uh, um, it, it should be no surprise to anybody that China is acting as every rising power before it, it, it's the surprise is that it's a surprise to people. I mean, you know, there was a lot of hope that actually China would would um, be be something different. I mean, be something different even than the United States was, and and have more ambition and seek more influence and want to change the world order more to its liking. So in that sense, it's not acting any differently. Um, you know, I have I have a map in the book early on that it also explains from a Chinese defense planner's perspective why you would be acting this way, you feel boxed in with one coastline. Um, but what's dangerous, just because it's natural to act this way doesn't mean it's, it's making the world safer. In, in fact, quite the contrary. So I think this combination of uh, very repressive authoritarian government at home uh, that uh, seeks to reshape the world order to be less democratic, more subversive of democratic ideas and norms, as well as real conflicting geostrategic interests in the Indo-Pacific with, with the United States makes, it, uh, makes its rise, I think, a bit more dangerous than it otherwise would be from, say, a naturally rising power. What do you think we've gotten wrong about its rise? What, what's been misinterpreted about how it's risen? Well, so I think a number of things. So I think first you have uh, this decade in the 1990s in particular, maybe the late 1980s. Remember, it was a Cold War ally, so there's some understandable reasons uh, why we got it wrong in retrospect, but uh, we saw a fast reforming China, and, and that's the fact. I mean, Deng Xiaoping had taken over from Mao Zedong, who had just ravaged China, uh, impoverished it. It was continuous revolutions, killed tens of millions of people, and we saw this reformer in Deng Xiaoping, and he really did change the economy. I mean, he really did make uh, Chinese livelihood better. And in the process, obviously, had opened up huge opportunities for, for US and, and Europeans and, and so on. So we got it wrong in, in, in misreading how far he would go in terms of more reforms and, and less ambition internationally, and then how his successors would reform. And then I, and, you know, and then I would say quickly that we're, we're, we may be getting it wrong again in sort of now that we see the problem, overestimating their economic uh, potential while underestimating their military um, the power and their uh, ideological fervor and ambition. Well, so as a China hand, we're both China hands, we both know how much China's history, its imperial traditions, you know, paint the way its future. I really like you to talk about how do you see its imperial traditions um, how has it inspired their goals and ambitions, as well as what does it mean for the region? What does it mean for Taiwan? Absolutely. So um, not only did I pick a catchy title, uh, The China Nightmare, but uh, I start off the book by saying, look, this is what China is. Let's get this right. It's a Leninist empire, it still is. So I have another map early on in the book that says, look, this is the only country remaining in the world that if you looked at its imperial borders at the height of its conquest in the Qing dynasty, which is not ancient history, that's during the time of 
uh, you know, that's during the time that, that uh, the U.S. Was, was born as a country. Uh, at the height of its conquest, the People's Republic of China's borders look almost exactly identical. You can't say that about any other country. You can't say that about Russia today. It'd be like looking at Turkey and saying, not only do they seek the same Ottoman lands, they actually control them, right? So it is an empire and it's, it's lording over those, con those lands it, it conquered in, um, in the Qing dynasty. And Taiwan is the last imperial holdout. So if it wants to look exactly like the Qing dynasty, okay, there's parts of Mongolia that have gone uh, away out of Mongolia, but, but now that they have Hong Kong back effectively, Taiwan remains. Taiwan remains as the last part of that Qing dynasty that is not part of China. So I want to, I hope I can ask you one more question because I really want to ask, you write about how Beijing is now strong and powerful enough to offer a new global politics that both protects and exports China's authoritarian regime um, model, political model. Can you talk to us about that? How is it doing that? I mean, to a lot of people, China is this incredible engine of productivity and you know, you can't do anything without buying something for China. So how is it how is it exporting this political model? Well, I think I think you're picking up on something that has made it so difficult for policymakers and still will be very difficult for uh, policymakers. Unlike, say, competition with the Soviet Union. China actually has a functioning economy. I mean, it may be much uh, growing in, in, in a much slower rate than, than, than people think, but it's still a very, very big market at scale, which with huge attractions for, for um, US companies, European companies, Southeast Asian companies, and it will remain that way, even if it grows uh, uh, you know, more slowly. And that, has a, that gives it enormous leverage in international politics. Uh, on the other hand, it's got this um, increasingly under Xi Jinping, uh, repressive authoritarian sort of high-tech police state that it's exporting abroad both in a very concrete sense going into African and other nations and, and providing the know-how in terms of how do you keep power, repress your people in this modern age, uh, as well as you know reshaping global institutions, uh, reshaping um, the WHO as we've seen, the Human Rights Council, and so on, all to put uh, either either uh, China's own people in those positions so that China can't be criticized, human rights can't be criticized, and so on. So um, you also write that the CCP sees itself as actually vulnerable. Um, it's the second largest economy uh, or on its way to being the second largest. Why would the CCP, why would you argue that the CCP actually sees itself as vulnerable right now? Well, you certainly don't have to take, um, you know, my word for it. Uh, you know, you, you can see how Xi Jinping is acting. Uh, and in many ways, he is obviously acting like a very powerful strongman. But um, the way he, he talks in Chinese, some of the documents that leak about, and I have this in the book too, there's this famed document nine that lays out all the threats that he sees to, uh, to his rule. And it's an enormous amount of threats. I mean, everything from things you would imagine like uh, you know, US imperialism to cultural, cultural threats, he defines them. So you have to block cultural threats. Uh, so this is not, this is a man that's, that acts very arrogantly and, and, and keeps asserting more power and control, uh, but in doing so, he does a number of things. One, he, he shows how fearful he is about letting go of any control and the other thing he does is he creates new enemies, powerful enemies inside of China by going after people, uh, you know, that, that used to be sort of uh, immune from, from CCP wrath. So, so I think internally there's a lot more political contestation. The way that that manifests for us in the West is, uh, you know, we see high profile people being jailed and, and so forth. So it looks like he has it under control. As we know, from the Soviet Union and other examples, you don't really know there's a problem internally until it's until it's gone, and then everyone says, "Oh, I knew it all along." Right? Everyone says, "You know, oh, right, that regime was in decay." So I think we see signs of it today, and we should watch for that. In terms of you, you also write China is competing aggressively to corrode the free and open order America built in favor of the new global order, um, and we've seen that. In, Talk to me about 
what are your policy recommendations? We're one week after an administration. What are your suggestions, recommendations as we embark on a new administration looking at where we go from here with China? Well, I think that um, we had, and this is sort of inside Washington and all that, but we had a national security strategy in 2017. And while well, you were serving at high levels in the Pentagon and national defense strategy in 2018, that paved the, paved the road forward for us. And a recently declassified Indo-Pacific uh, strategy that also paves the road forward. I mean, so it's absolutely the number one goal is to not allow China to be hegemonic in the Indo-Pacific. If they achieve that, if they achieve that through military means, ideological, diplomatic means, other means, then um, we would be locked out of, of the most dynamic, most important region in the world. And that would quickly lead towards uh, global hegemony. So number one is, is depend on our allies, depend on our military, uh, make sure that our diplomacy is constructing an order that is pluralistic, that is impossible to be dominated by China, preferably with uh, you know, the, the big democracies on our side, but obviously there are countries that are friends that are also not yet democracies. Uh, you know, that's the most important thing, is not allowing uh, China to, to be uh, hegemonic and to create a sinosphere. You know, easier said than done. I mean, I think there's some policies that have been followed uh, that uh, took us in that direction. Uh, hopefully they'll be continued, you know, building up alliances, changing our defense posture, uh, starting to really highlight to countries uh, the malign influence that China projects into those countries and so on, a, 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 pol a panoply of policy tools. I think as we look forward into a next administration that uh, is always tempted to review things as next administrations do, I think that um, you know the, there's the allure of, of the China market for Europeans and, and for Americans that continues to put huge pressure on an administration, continuing with a hard line against China. China is going to is going to fight back very hard in terms of uh, the leverage it uses commercially, in terms of gaining influence here in Washington and in other places, uh, and uh, there are enormous other pressures, particularly during a pandemic recovery. Uh, you know, if you're if you're if an administration is interested in solving uh, global action problems, uh, you know, as as they've said regarding climate change, you know, there's there's going to be all kinds of competing pressures. I think generally, the the strategies that I mentioned will be more or less followed. But when it comes to some tough decisions, we'll just have to really see whether um, you know tough domestic decisions are made that actually resource this China strategy. One thing is, um, actually, when I was at the Pentagon, I, I had the opportunity with Secretary Mattis to meet um, President Xi. And, and one of the refrains that we heard was the peaceful rise of China, uh, a win-win solution. Um, I'd like for you to talk about that in terms of what we've seen over the last few years um, with respect to that mantra. Um, and what does that mean for the region? Not just the globe, but, but really what does that mean for the region um, with China's kind of conversation about a peaceful rise, but perhaps its actions not already being congruent with that? So the informational and, and ideological component of China's grand strategy is, can be very effective. So the reason they talk in that manner about win-win solutions and harmonious uh, benign Rise. Uh, they used to say peaceful. I guess. I guess they still did when they talked to you, and <laughs> they knew who they were talking to. Uh, but um, you know, so that's you know, uh, Asian countries. It's it's become trite and cliche, but it's certainly true. Asian countries do not want another Cold War, um, and 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 it's not like we're going around asking them to choose between the United States and China. I think we very much understand that they're going to have commercial interests in China as we do. Uh, but also understand increasingly the problems with respect to China. So we're not the ones that are tr trying to create this two block system or a cold war. China's playing on their fears, saying that if you uh, sign up with the United States in, in security matters, you're gonna create a cold war. It's gonna divide the world again. You didn't like that back in uh, Soviet times. We're gonna make your life really difficult. So that's one reason they constantly blame the United States 
that when they say win-win in private meetings or in public meetings, what they're telling the rest of the world is that's not what the United States wants. The United States is hegemonic and imperialistic, takes advantage of you. So it's um, it's 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 clever. It's a clever way to uh, you know to play on people's fears that that the United States competing with China is going to lead to something far worse than the status quo. And let's and let's talk about the leadership, and let's also talk about the elites. Um, that's a huge component to stability uh, and prosperity. Um, obviously, China. You write that China still kind of lingers in the history and of, of, of 1989. Um, talk to us about how Xi Jinping has has managed the elite and and centralized power. Well, so it, it, in the book, I have a section. Um, about that, right? So in 2012, uh, this is this is uh, often um, not well known, right? Why why was China changing so sharply in the last decade? Uh, one reason was in 2012 uh, there was let's call it a mini succession crisis. So um, Xi Jinping was supposed to uh, you know be the new paramount leader and take over from uh, Hu Jintao, but Bo Xilai, who was um, very much like Xi Jinping, but maybe more charismatic. He was uh, the son of a lieutenant close to Mao, what they call the red aristocracy, um, you know, and, and, and grew up in a way that, that really believed in the party and really despite the cultural revolution and everything like that. He, so he was very charismatic in Chongqing. He was building up his own power base, extremely corrupt, uh, but, but made a bid, an independent bid for power in 2012. His, he was brought down extremely hard and viciously. His wife was uh, caught um, being involved in a murder of a, of a, a British sort of go-between fixer. Um, it, it, in fact, is the subject of, of a movie that I hear that is, because uh, it is movie-like in its particulars. Um, I can't remember the name right now. Um, but, uh, um, but anyway, so, so Xi Jinping disappeared for a while in 2012, he got the party elders to all agree to give him the mandate to take absolute power. And not only that, he did something very important in elite Chinese politics. As you know, he got the mandate to go after uh, very powerful figures, ex Politburo members for corruption, unheard of before that in China. There was this kind of mafia-like rule that you're allowed to be corrupt if you're on the Politburo and you've got absolute immunity. Well, when he started going after Bo Xi Lai's allies, Zhou Yongkong, security czar, and so on, he was changing the rules of Chinese politics. Big gamble. It's worked so far. Um, so he neutralized in these purges that he, that he put under the rubric of anti-corruption many of his potential enemies. Uh, but as I, as I said before, uh, maybe won't work over the longer term because there are people lying in wait for him to make mistakes and uh, and you know to uh, to jump on those mistakes in order to either push him out of power or uh, neutralize him in some other way. So so I think uh, short term he got a, a lot of um, support for these purges and centralized control. But longer term he might have created more risks for himself. What do you think if you're in Vietnam, if you're in Taiwan, if you're in Cambodia, what? What do, should they take from China's rise and, and, its, and its tactics, its current tactics? It's hard to answer your questions coming from someone who probably knows the answers in some ways better than I do. You've been to these countries and led with and, and met with these leaders. I think, I think each country is, is positioned differently, right? When you talk about Vietnam, uh, you talk about a country that's had a long history warding off um, Chinese threats and uh, in a section on history in my book talks about how Vietnam was one of the most uh, signified or, or controlled, um, you know, Chinese, uh, uh, you know, Chinese part of the China, China sphere, China sphere, tributary. Um, so Vietnam knows, you know, knows exactly what they're dealing with, but obviously there have been, um, you know, there have been real skepticism when it comes to us for obvious reasons. I think he probably traveled there with Secretary Mattis. I think the Department of Defense and, and other agencies did an excellent job opening up to Vietnam. Um, you know, Vietnam is is uh, 
is going to be a decent security partner and good economic partner. Obviously, um, you know, human rights abuses are going to be a thorn uh, in, in the side of the relationship as well. But, you know, good security partner, uh, one of the better ones. And so it just, it depends what, so with, in Asia, you know, in some ways, unlike Europe, I, you know, I'm, I'm being very simplistic about this. The countries each have such different histories with China and um, different tight structure of economic trade is different. Australia's trade is more export dependent and therefore more uh, susceptible to pressure from boycotts, whereas uh, you know other countries are, are less susceptible. So so much depends on susceptibility to the terms of trade, in terms of the history, in terms of how close you are. Uh, Japan obviously is in a category by itself because of uh, its own past with China. Uh, and then um, how China really stirs up that past for nationalistic purposes today, for geopolitical purposes today. So, um, you know, each country, you know, maybe bottom line shares the same goal I said before, which is want to make sure China is not dominant and want us to be uh, influential and, and project power there. But each country is situated just a bit differently. So I've asked you a lot about what China's doing. I, I want to know what you also think about, you know, as this as IRI, um, what can democracies do? How can the United States, um, Asian democracies, what can we do to influence um, China's rise? Well, so in Asian democracies is, is, is the good news story of transitions that nobody knows about anymore, right? So when people say uh, uh, democracy reform or democracy promotion, they automatically now think about you know Iraq and and uh, Afghanistan and the Arab Spring, but uh, you know the story needs to be told more about about the transitions, you know that that the peaceful pe all peaceful transitions South Korea, Taiwan, um, you know Indonesia, the Philippines. I mean obviously uneven to be sure, but but peaceful transitions, India, you know with um, a whole a lot of people. So that's extremely important to, to, to tell that story. And the U.S. had a diplomatic role in each one of those. And Congress had a diplomatic role, had a role as well. So, um, you know, this was, this was the question of when to use, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan was extremely deeply involved, you know, when to use your power to push allies in a certain direction. I think we'll be facing that again with certain countries over time, like Vietnam, uh, you know, that are our allies and you do build leverage over your allies. So that's one thing. So um, the other thing is, is some of the things we're doing. Um, there's this wonky uh, grouping called the Quad, uh, the Australian, you know, US, uh, India, and Japan, and, and people criticize it. It's not doing enough. But the fact of the matter is four great democracies are standing up uh, and saying, uh, this is the, what the Asian order is going to look like. Uh, and, and that could be enough for now. Um, in terms of... Um, in terms of democracy, you know, and, and so it's incredibly important to defend Taiwan, not just for geostrategic reasons, but the ideological framework, uh, you know, setting the right ideological environment in, in Asia when it's hostile to China's aims. So a Chinese democracy in the heart of, uh, you know, what strategists call the first island chain is so key uh, to, to democracy in, in Asia and the kind of order we want. In terms of you know uh, the promotion of, of of Chinese human rights, I mean, always it just becomes so difficult over over the last uh, you know twenty years or so. Um, obviously, IRI and National Endowment for Democracy uh, do do everything they can. Um, you know the um, you know, but but we ought not shy away from it too much either because it's it's not just a moral obligation but it's also uh, part of a strategy, right? So the more Xi Jinping has to defend against uh, the work by dissidents who are working with people from abroad, the more he has to defend against uh, Western ideas and, and that are propagated by Chinese uh, citizens, speakers, uh, you know, the more he's got to worry about things that, that he'd rather not worry about. So it should be part of a US grand strategy as well in terms of our security relations and not just, not just, uh, not only a moral obligation. One of the, one of the things that's probably the biggest difference, uh, 
when Ronald Reagan and the Cold War and we had this very strong, we were very strongly proponents of democracy, um, the economics have changed. Yeah. The economics have changed. Um, and you've seen that and you've seen companies, you've seen, you've seen lots of people, um, um, well, fudge on where they stand on things um, based on the economics. What advice or guidance would you give to businesses, to, to organizations that do have interests, no kidding interest in China and, 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 and see the good things and, and see the, the middle class that's risen in China, who's seen a lot of great things happen um, in mainland China, but still is challenged um, to promote democracy? Well, it's um, it is a big challenge, and and as you say, it's so different from from Reagan and the Cold War, in, in the sense of I mean, look at the sectors that do benefit from the China market. Uh, there are quite a few. I guess when I talk to businesses, I, I say a number of things. I mean, first, um, the way things uh, a lot of businesses uh, would come speak to us in government or or out of government in 2004, 2005, 2006, things didn't pan out the way they wanted them to, in many cases for many of the businesses, um, you know, in terms of having to deal with Chinese censorship, in terms of having to deal with IP theft and trade secret theft, in terms of entire industries getting uh, subsid you know, subsidized by China and squeezed out. And we're gonna see that soon, I think, um, in other industries. We saw it obviously with telecommunications and Huawei pure mercantilist predation that put everyone else out of business in that industry. So no one's safe, uh, no industry safe. Um, if you look at um, things coming down the, the, the line besides Huawei, uh, you know, as we move to look at climate and clean tech, you know, we're gonna see China's dominance in things like the battery industry and how they're gonna squeeze other competitors out. So, um, you know, businesses uh, I think may have a more realistic point of view on their, on their commercial prospects. But it's always important to really point out what China does in the end with its predatory behavior. Uh, and it does not have US businesses best interest at heart. So that's on the commercial side. You know, on the governmental side, in terms of shaping incentives, uh, we certainly started a process over the last few years to try to target certain expert controls and investment reviews. Uh, and, um, you know, that's going to take some time to sharpen. So there's a difference between selling something that ends up in a mobile phone in China versus selling something that, that ends up in a missile component or a repression of the Uyghurs. And uh, we're smart enough to make those distinctions, um, but the incentives really have to change. Um, so we're gonna be doing business in China. You know, it's just, it's just a question of which sectors are we going to ensure that we're uh, keeping away uh, from in terms of helping the Chinese build military power or oppress human rights. What if you had to say if there's one thing that we've gotten right and gotten wrong about China over the last decade, what would it be? Uh, well, one thing that we've gotten right about China over the last decade, I mean, so I, I, I'd really have to say um, the country's uh, attitude towards China uh, in the last, you know, let's say, four years um, is, is, is turning in the right direction in the sense of uh, even if you aren't a policy expert or you're not a, uh, a DC wonk or a, or a news reporter, uh, you know, you can tell there's just something off that you don't want this big authoritarian country that, that has been cheating economically to be the number one power. Uh, and that, I think that's been some good work done by um, public speeches, by leading uh, policymakers, politicians, and so on. That's been, you know, uh, you know and, and we've started some, some decent attempts at reversing China's malign influence uh, inside the United States and elsewhere. Obviously, the big things we got wrong, uh, you know, I mean, where to begin? Uh, you know, uh, the idea that China would become a responsible stakeholder in the international system, given its ideological basis, um, you know, continually inviting it into every international organization. You know, let me just pick on one. I mean, inviting it and you know, not paying attention to inviting it into the World Health Organization and what it was doing to politic to get its own 
you know, people in charge. Now we pay for it during the pandemic. I mean, the list of what we did wrong is just, it's just endless. Uh, and uh, there's a bit of willful blindness. There's the commercial aspect. You're being polite about it. I mean, China, look, Randy started this off by saying this is a Leninist regime. It is a Leninist regime and it's using Leninist tactics. So it uses united front groups, which we, and active measures, things we haven't seen since the Soviet times. It, 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 call, it doesn't quite call people useful idiots. It calls them magic weapons, but it uses, uh, that, that was Lenin's term, the, the term in China's magic weapons, but it uses influential elites in all democracies to carry, to carry its message. And, and it uses the allure of its, of its uh, access and its, its commercial power. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more active and, and there've been more egregious cases in the West than, than uh, we care to admit. Is there any prescription you would give our viewers to, to, to see China through a lens? Like, as we continue to see China evolve, as we go through the, the pandemic, as we continue, we go into a new administration, what are the questions that we should be asking ourselves um, as we consider, the, you know, the, our personal decisions, you know, as we make decisions about lots of things, um, business decisions, what do we, how do we need to think about China? Well, I've, I've offered in my argument in, in the book, which is, uh, it is, it is certainly formidable. It is uh, certainly ambitious. The scale is almost too hard to, to get your head around, right? So if 5% of the population is doing well, that's what, 70 million people? I mean, that's a, the size of a country, you know? And, and so, you know, when someone says, well, it's not 10 feet tall, it's stagnating and I can make the argument that it is, still, I mean, if you're sitting in Malaysia or you're sitting in Vietnam or you're in a, in a company selling to China somewhere, you know, what if, what if 8% are buying your products? I mean, it's, it's un unimaginable, right? So it's, it's hard to get your head around that. Um, so, but, but we ought to. And let me just, you know, the reason that I think it's important to say, look, it's extremely formidable, it's extremely powerful, it's extremely dangerous, but it's not good at everything. It's not this juggernaut that's unstoppable. It's not competing with us on, it's not winning every race, which is what we're trying to say today. It's not, it's just not, right? I mean, I'll just give you an example. We won the vaccine race, hands down, coming and going. I mean, you know, our vaccines, uh, because of all the time and effort we put in the years before it into the scientific study because of our free and open and lawful uh, ecosystem of innovation and science and technology, because of our profitable companies, um, you know, we're not, you know, we're not going, you know, we're not near, there's all kinds of mistakes. I mean, we're not near going out and, and subsidizing it for our, for our friends in the developing world. And China is going out and doing that, but that's, that's extremely perilous. Right, because China's putting out ineffective uh, vaccines without any data um, and, and putting out disinformation about our vaccines. But, you know, eventually, you know, when we're back on our feet, uh, what my, the, the main point of what I'm saying is we're still winning technological races. We're still extremely wealthy. We still have enormous reserves of power. Um, there's a backlash against China. What I'd, what I'd want everyone to leave thinking today is China is posing one of the greatest competitive threats to the United States we've ever faced. However, through the right sets of internal and external strategies, it is, it is not uh, destined or inevitable to be the global uh, hegemon or leader. One question I've always wanted to know um, is what do you think, how much of China's actions are about its domestic audience versus the global audience. I mean, that is that is the tension of all big countries. I mean, we could even say that about the US, for about America. What's the tension and how much is um, President Xi thinking about, you know, what the US might do versus what his, you know, 5% of his population might do? Mm -hmm. Right or you know, more if you're talking about people who aren't doing well in China. 
Uh, just just to give you some idea, more idea on scale, I just love these scale questions because 5% of a successful population in China is, is um, you know, is, is a large country. China is also going to become quickly the oldest country in the world, right? The oldest country that's not rich. So um, it's, um, it's going to have in the next generation, it's only like 15 years, 100 million new 65-year-olds and older. So it's going to be the biggest old country. If you just if you just took the senior citizens, you'd say this is a really large country, right? I mean, if you took so the scale is is just just kind of blows your mind. But um, you know, in terms of domestic, so so she has to worry about all of that, everything I just said, right? I mean, he has to worry about the largest elderly population without enough money to pay for them, without children to take care of them because of the one child policy, uh, you know, without a social safety net. He's got to worry about, uh, you know, I, I, I tweeted out today that um, China is catching up to us in something. Debt, they're catching us. They've surpassed us in debt. You know, you're a real player. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, and they're not rich. Like we can, you know, that, you know so, you know, uh, environmental disasters, air and, and water pollution, um, you know, as I said, elite, it's a lot more discomfort in elite politics. Um, he's got to worry about all that. This document nine I mentioned, cultural threats. But here's something interesting in terms of answering your question. So the thing that China worries about the most and, and the thing that they constantly arrest dissidents for is this, it's, it, it roughly translates to this connection between um, domestic dissidents. Uh, why does it fear Tiananmen so much? Okay, because the belief is that there was collusion among foreign hostile forces and domestic reformers. That is the number one fear. So they don't make that much of a distinction. So every time somebody high profile is arrested, they're arrested on that same charge. So Tiananmen for them is a siege mentality that the West, meaning the United States, is constantly trying to bring down the Chinese Communist Party, no matter what we say. And there's internal subversion inside as well. And that's the number one fear. That's the number one fear. It explains a lot of China's behavior. Well, I am so glad that we've got to have this conversation, Dan. You and I have had many conversations, but your book is really compelling. Um, I would really encourage people to take a look at it and, and pick it up. Um, it's 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 really great, and it really makes you think about what are the implications, um, what what have we gotten wrong, uh, but how do we get it right in the future? So. So thank you for doing that. So I think we have some questions. Oh, and okay. So Eric Schwartz-Waltz at the Wall Street Journal um, asks, what role do you see soft power movies, entertainment, cultural exchanges playing in China's campaign to appeal to other countries? Well, it's, it's a great question. I mean, China is trying very hard uh, to appeal to other countries based on what it views as a unique culture and civilization. And it absolutely has one. I mean, you know, it's thousands of years of, of civilization and, and one can go to Taiwan and see that, right? I mean, in China, it's harder, it's harder to really see um, the greatness of the civilization because the Communist Party destroyed so much of that tradition, um, you know, in, in, uh, through the Cultural Revolution and so forth. I think where the battle is really joined, you mentioned Hollywood. I always ask this question to every group I talk to. Has anyone ever seen a Chinese villain in a Hollywood film? The answer is probably no. Uh, you know, maybe somebody, some real movie buff will say, well, but that's, there's a reason for that. And that's the market in, in China won't allow for it. So I think China, uh, when it comes to propagation of, of information and news, it'll do fine. But the real way in which it'll compete is undermining our own soft power by uh, forcing our cultural institutions, coercing them as they've done and the West cultural institutions to censor themselves when it comes to China, to censor themselves when it comes to human rights abuses. We now see this in the National Basketball Association, in Hollywood, in other places. And so that means that there are big, important, cultural icons in the United States that are afraid to speak out freely about China. 
So the next question, and I apologize in advance if I butcher anyone's name, but um, Michael Sobolik from the American Foreign Policy Council. What do you believe are the most important differences between US strategic culture and Chinese strategic culture? And how do these differences matter to US policymakers today? The number one difference I would say is the Chinese uh, throughout um, their strategic history it, believe in deception and hiding things and surprise and stratagem where the United States couldn't hide something if it, if it spent all the money in the world uh, in terms of secrets, in terms of, uh, it, you know, we confuse everybody, you know, because of our raucous debates but imagine trying to hide a new national defense strategy. I mean, we just de declassified our Indo-Pacific strategy. So the, the biggest difference is the US views deterrence as something you show and China views deterrence for the most part, obviously there's exceptions, these are broad generalizations as uh, you know, or, or I should say very tied to traditional stratagems, deceptions and, and surprise. And you, you see that throughout the wars they fought in the 20th century. So the next question is from, oh, from Tigran Hamabara Zumanian. Sorry. Can it be assumed there is a bluff with China's economic growth as the CCP provides unreliable loans to countries that cannot repay it? And from the point of view of domestic policy, China, um, China invests in various economically unprofitable infrastructures, the cost of which will only be recovered after many years. Well, yes. And, and uh, you know, I have the pleasure of working with many economists who look at, uh, at this problem. Uh, you know, you know uh, Truman's famous saying about the one-handed economist who can't say on the other hand all the time. But um, I think I think everybody agrees that Chinese GDP figures are completely made up uh, and and unreliable. So um, so we you know people tend to look at other things and the way they get the debt numbers is corporate debt and debt and but there's no question that um, China's still growing, but but it reversed its reforms in a way that the state has come back into the commanding heights of industry and by its nature funds unprofitable projects that, that collect more debt, uh, that, you know, state-run state, state run en enterprises and so on. Uh, so I think, um, I think the GDP numbers they put out, you just can't rely on them, which makes things even more difficult for non-economists uh, as well. In terms of loaning to the world, um, they're, you know, they're obviously loaning quite a bit of money to, to the developing world. Um, you know, they, they come in in certain places where they want uh, the naval facilities or ports and so on. And uh, either they make loans uh, and instead of getting paid back, they, they might get concessions on a facility or they, you know, grab someone else's defaulted loan. But yeah, it's, it's complicating matters quite a bit from a strategic and a developmental perspective. So I have a question here from a Canadian diplomat who wishes to remain anonymous, but um, asks, could Mr. Blumenthal talk about China's strategic interests in Africa and how this will intersect or conflict with U.S. and broader Western interests? Well, uh, Chinese interests are, are in some ways more clear than, than ours are in Africa. So China um, has, uh, has been active in, in Africa, obviously since Mao, but we don't have to go that far back. That was an interest in um, communist revolution and, and uh, uh, influence in that respect. But um, in the last 10, 15 years, I mean, there's been a huge commodities interest, you know, to feed uh, China's uh, growth. That's died down a bit. Uh, there's been an interest in, in acquiring naval facilities uh, along the Indian Ocean, which I think more to come on that. Um, there's been an interest in um, the UN. So I keep Picking on the WHO, which I think deserves to be picked on after this year, but um, you know uh, its activities, bilateral activities with Ethiopia, and its lobbying for uh, Mr. Tedros to become the head of the WHO, uh, you know, had a lot to do with influence it, it had gained in certain African countries. Uh, so lots of clear interest for China in in Africa. 
the U.S., uh, I, to my knowledge, without being an expert on Africa, is still not clear what its interests in Africa are. So um, in that sense, it's, it's not really competing in Africa. I mean, you know, the U U.S. has defined interests pretty clearly in the Indo-Pacific, maybe in Europe with respect to Russia, but Africa, it seems like uh, the U.S. still, since the Cold War, has not defined clear interests. So China has, has uh, you know, has made great inroads. So the next question is from Indir Rekha. Will the differences between the U.S. and EU approaches towards China have an impact on the efficiency of any sanctions or condemnations towards the human rights violations committed by the CCP? Well, yes, they, they already have. I mean, so, uh, uh, you know, the Germans in particular went ahead with this uh, deal with China, this investment deal. It has a lot to do with the future of its own auto industry, frankly, and Chinese investments uh, in certain types of technologies in Germany and access uh, by German uh, companies into China, uh, really kind of pushing aside the human rights concerns and, and other technological concerns. So um, yeah, unfortunately, look, uh, the Biden administration has pledged to work more closely with allies, uh, certainly uh, members of the Trump administration try to do the same. It's a lot more difficult, a lot more difficult uh, when it comes to China and Europe than um, than anyone thinks. I mean, you know, first of all, what is Europe? We could have that whole philosophical debate. But when it comes to Germany and France and and commercial interests, um, they're very big in China and and UK also. Um, you know, there's some good cooperation in NATO, decent cooperation. Uh, and so on, but it, it's going to be very tough to come up with an allied, combined allied strategy on technology controls and a combined allied strategy on human rights. China is going to pick the countries apart. Okay, here's another question from Bessa Shara. How do you feel about Chinese membership in the World Trade Organization? Well, I don't feel great about it, but <laughs> there's, not, there's nothing we can do now. Um, I was part of a commission that uh, was, was uh, uh, I think Randy Schoenemann might have had something to do with it, that was uh, sort of a, a compromise to, to those in the Congress in, in the Senate who, who, from the right and the left, who opposed the ascension to the WTO um, in, in 2000, uh, 2001. You know, they created a commission to watch China's economic and security developments. Um, but look, there's, there's no sense harping on that now. I mean, we're not going to kick them out of the WTO. We're not going to leave the WTO. Um, you know, there's, there's ways in which from a, uh, you know, from a WTO standpoint, um, there's cases that have been successful against China, cases that haven't been successful against China. Um, you know, we're going to have to have a, a trade and anti-predatory strategy that is through the WTO it is not through the WTO, you know, uh, but the most effective one will be if the US and the EU, the two biggest markets in Japan, can get together and decide which offending Chinese companies, the, the biggest offenders when it comes to human rights, national security and intellectual property are just not allowed to do business in our countries. Uh, so there's going to be overlapping strategies when it comes to dealing with China's economic malfeasance. So here's another a, a great question, um, sent anonymously, but I'm sure on many people's mind. Should China be held accountable for the global COVID-19 pandemic? If so, how? Well, it absolutely should be held accountable. So I, I rushed in and afterward to my book um, about China's responsibility for COVID. I mean, look, if China had acted more responsibly, uh, you know, I don't think we'd be in the same situation we are today. I mean, uh, without reporting human transmission, thousands upon thousands of Chinese were leaving China every day, probably with COVID. Um, so uh, they should certainly be held accountable. We don't believe any of the numbers that they're giving on infection rates, on deaths. They're just not true. They can't be true if you just do it statistically, comparing if they actually had done the testing that, say, South Korea had done. Um, so they should certainly be held accountable. We could start by uh, hopefully ignoring all these calls to cooperate on, on pandemic solutions. I mean, China has no interest in that. I mean, China to this day is not allowing full transparency into its labs, 
biosafety uh, you know, investigations into the Wuhan lab. Uh, it is uh, not reporting accurately on its numbers on COVID. It, it is spreading disinformation about our uh, very effective vaccines. So the first thing is, is do no harm. I mean, the idea of cooperating on public health is just a non-starter. Uh, held to account, um, you know, there's all kinds of ways I think we can, we can hold China to account. I think to a certain extent, we imposed a cost last year just by, we should have done this anyway, of course, to be sure, but just by cooperating with Taiwan on healthcare and uh, you know, support for Taiwan and its global healthcare efforts. And we should do that anyway, but that's one cost China should pay uh, for sure. So let's do a rapid round because we only have a few more minutes and I want to get these great questions in. Okay. Brian Keeter at APCO Worldwide says, Confucius Institutes on university campuses across the nation have decreased significantly after scrutiny by members of Congress and others. What other instruments of the authoritarian regime are in play in the US to which policymakers and democracy advocates should be paying attention to? Well, if you start, if if you start, you know, you can go through the, the culture, cultural institutions. We call it the long march, Chinese long march through the culture, our cultural institutions. So, there's a great uh, Hoover Institute and I think Asia Policy uh, Asia Society Group report on influence. So one of it is just money, in terms of how much money they're spending on campuses for students for programs, some of which are uh, obviously not being reported well, and people are facing prosecution. A lot of a lot of money in, in, that the universities increasingly depend upon uh, coming from uh, coming from the PRC, um, the one institution. I go back to I th I think the most corrosive effect on the United States, at least, there will certainly be more political influence campaigns as we've seen in places like California. But I think the most corrosive effect is this kind of self censoring people are going to continue doing. In, 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 in places that are cultural icons to us because the Chinese will threaten to cut off access to the China market. At last, so I think last question. Um, and again, Marina, sorry. Marina Samakaraz Karadas from Georgetown. One of the main reasons for the USSR's collapse was ineffective and an unsustainable economic system. Would it be proper to say that this is the same case for China at present as well? Uh, no, uh, it's not because while I argue that there's stagnation, uh, that there's still growth, it's just slower growth. It, it's more like uh, Japan. It's more like Japan in 1991, 92, just Japan was far more rich. So I don't think, I don't see much, I don't see much uh, possibility for a real economic crisis, possible political crisis uh, in terms of succession and Xi Jinping. The other thing is so far, the Chinese haven't spent the same amount that the Soviets did as a percentage of their GDP on military competition. Now, in terms of competing with China effectively, we can change that calculus, but that's one of the things obviously that brought the Soviet economy down. Well, that's perfect. Thank you, Dan. And thank you guys for all of your great questions. I am going to turn it back over to the wonderful Randy Schumann to uh, close us out. Thank you, Dana, for a terrific job of moderating. Uh, thank you, Dan, for your insightful book, The Paradox of a Powerful Rising Empire, Beset by Insecurities and Vulnerabilities, and like all dictatorships, they fear their own people. As you pointed out um, in your book and in the discussion today, this document nine details threats. Um, that the Chinese Communist Party sees, constitutional democracy, freedom of the press, universal values, human rights, civil society. These are the essence of what IRI does uh, and what IRI seeks to promote around the world. If you want to stay tuned on this uh, subject on February 3rd with foreign policy, IRI uh, will have a, a panel on China's geopolitical influence. It follows the landmark report that IRI's bridge project, Building Resil Resilience into Democracies, has done about China's malign geopolitical influence. Uh, and a great discussion today. And I'd like to just close with a quote from Dan's book, page 100, for those of you following at home. How long will the Chinese people continue to thank the CCP 
for lifting millions of people out of poverty when their dreams of a promised future fade away and their liberty is stifled. When that patience runs out of the Chinese people, the China nightmare will be for the Chinese Communist Party. Thank you again, Dana and Dan, for a terrific discussion. Thank you all for, for tuning in and for your terrific questions. Have a great rest of your day.